you know that there are several features of data that you can extract from a time frequency analysis. So power, time varying changes in power at different frequencies is the primary measure, the primary feature that is used in time frequency plots. And you learned in this section on synchronization that connectivity is basically, all, it seems like connectivity is all about phase synchronization. All the measures that I've introduced you to so far are all about looking at phase values and how phase values are coupled between different electrodes over time, over trials, and so on. And so in this video, I'm going to introduce you to two methods for computing connectivity based on power. Now, there is a lot less empirical research that has been done on power-based connectivity. And that's because the neuroscience theory, the physiology theory, which I introduced you to in one of the lectures in the beginning of this section, is really optimized for phase. So the kind of neuroscience theory about brain connectivity is strongly related to phase. It predicts that phase and phase synchronization is really important. There isn't much of an understanding, there isn't much theory at this point, you know, at the time that I'm recording this, there isn't a whole lot of solid neurophysiological theory that strongly predicts that power-based connectivity should be an important variable. Now that said, people do compute power-based connectivity in empirical data sets, and it's in the published literature, and it does seem like it's relevant. It's just that, you know, this is more like something you can do with the data, and it's a little bit less clear how to interpret these results in terms of underlying physiological mechanisms. Okay, so with that said, I don't want to discourage the use of power-based connectivity. Actually, the opposite. I should be encouraging it because relatively little is known about what power-based connectivity means, what kinds of neural mechanisms would generate power-based connectivity. But it is important to realize that the reason why much of the literature uses phase for connectivity analyses instead of power is because the, there is a richer theory about why there should be phase synchronization. Okay, enough said. So I will introduce you to two methods for power-based connectivity. One of them is called amplitude envelope correlations. It is a pretty straightforward procedure and probably something that you would come up with on your own as well if you were just thinking about how to measure correlations or connectivity using the power time series or amplitude time series. So what you do is you have your two signals and then you apply wavelet convolution or filter Hilbert or short time FFT, whatever you like, and you obtain the time series of in this case, it's amplitude, but of course you could also use power. So you obtain the time series of amplitude values for two different electrodes, and then you have these two time series and you simply correlate them. And it's as simple as that. And if you find that the correlation is significantly different from zero, then it means that the power fluctuations in these two electrodes are correlated. Maybe they're positively correlated, like what you see here. Maybe they're negatively correlated, that's also possible. Now, one interesting aspect of amplitude envelope correlations, which is different from phase synchronization, is that here with amplitude envelope correlations, you can actually have the two signals be at different dominant frequencies or different center frequencies. So here we are looking at a signal that was filtered from 30 to 40 hertz, let's just call this 35 hertz. And here this is a signal that was filtered at 60 hertz. So now the amplitude envelope, the power time series, is actually coming from a different frequency. So that's pretty interesting because it gives you more opportunity, it gives you more flexibility for computing connectivity, not only between two different electrodes, but also between two different frequencies. So therefore, you can use amplitude envelope correlations as a measure of cross-frequency coupling because you have coupling across different frequencies. Now, this can be advantageous because it increases the flexibility of your possible analyses. But it can also be disadvantageous because it basically just opens up this huge, huge search space. You know, you can compute connectivity between all possible pairs of channels and all possible pairs of frequencies, and you just end up with a mountain of correlation coefficients, and it's not really clear how to, you know, how to correct for multiple comparisons. First of all, you can have a million 
uh, comparisons that you're that you have to deal with here and also how to interpret this mass of results so therefore my personal recommendation is to uh, stick to the same frequency for the two signals and to use different frequencies only when that's justified when you can motivate it somehow based on a theory based on prior data based on some prediction that you have about your experiment and so on it's really just a way of keeping things simple so you don't get overwhelmed with results. All right, so this is one method, amplitude envelope correlations. Another method is called trial to trial power coupling. So here we have region A and region B. So this can be, you know, electrode FZ and electrode O5 or whatever. So then you have the time frequency power, so we're working with power, time frequency power from trial 1 and trial 1 here. And then you have time frequency power from trial 2. Now, of course, this is like exactly the same picture here, but you know, imagine this would be the actual time frequency map from trial two from this electrode. And this is also the time frequency map from trial two from this other electrode. So what you do, you can probably already guess, you define some region, you define some time frequency region of interest, and that can be a different region of interest in the two electrodes. And then you extract the average power. So in this time frequency region, let's say this is maybe, you know, 100 to 250 milliseconds and, I don't know, 4 to 8 hertz up here. So I'm just making up these numbers, but it's just a bit of an illustration. So for trial 1, in this time frequency window, you average all of these pixels together. So you average all of the time frequency power points in this window here. And then that window is the same for every trial here up to n trials. And here in region B or electrode B, you do the same basic idea. So you still average together all of the power values in this time frequency window, trial one, trial two, up to trial n. And that gives you one number per trial per region. So in the end, you would end up with a set of numbers, a list of two, two lists of numbers that look something like this. So this would be trial one from electrode A and trial one from electrode B and so on. And then in the end, you simply correlate this vector with this vector and you look at that correlation coefficient. And then the idea is that if this correlation coefficient is, for example, positive and also statistically significant, which is not in this case, but that's okay. If this correlation is significantly positive, then that would mean that trials where power is increased in, uh, in electrode A, there's also an increase in power in uh, region B. And this is an interesting analysis. You also have a lot of flexibility here because not only can these come from different frequency bands, which is similar to the uh, envelope uh, correlations that I showed in the previous slide, but they can also come at different time windows. So you can say that early, let's say this is the gamma band, that early gamma band activity in posterior cortex is correlated with later lower frequency theta activity in the prefrontal cortex. So that is just an example of the kind of uh, interpretation you can make from this sort of analysis approach. You can see that with this method, trial to trial power coupling, similar to the previous method of amplitude envelope correlations, there are many, many, many possibilities for how to set up this analysis because these time frequency windows can be placed basically anywhere that seems feasible, anywhere that seems appropriate. And you can also have multiple windows, you know, maybe you also want to draw a time frequency window here around this blue blob, and then you could see whether this is correlated with this and also whether this is correlated with this over trials. Again, this much flexibility can be good, it can be useful because it gives you maximal control over creating and shaping the statistical analyses according to what best matches your specific experiment and your specific hypotheses. But you can also imagine that this much flexibility can be detrimental, it can cause some confusion, because if you just start correlating everything with everything and put a bunch of regions of interest all over the place, eventually, you know, you're going to end up with some significant results. And you'll have to worry about multiple comparisons, corrections, and it might be difficult to interpret. So as with my recommendation for the previous analysis, the amplitude envelope correlations, 
If you are using this method, it's a pretty neat method, then you will need to come up with some theoretically motivated ways of restricting yourself to specific a priori windows that are hypothesis-driven and that are feasible to test.